Welcome to Mind Pump, recently voted the number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast on the island of Cyprus. Thanks, guys. Whoa. Number one over there. Uh, in this episode, we answer fitness that? and health exactly questions that are asked by listeners uh, and viewers like you. So those guys on YouTube, you guys ask us questions, we'll answer them. And those of you in podcast land, you can always ask us questions. Just go to the Instagram page, Mind Pump Media, post your questions there. We pick the best ones. But the way we open the episode is by talking about current events. We tell stories. We have a lot of fun. In today's episode, that portion was 40 minutes long, so that's before we answer the questions. By the way, if you go to mindpumppodcast.com, you can look at timestamps, so you can fast forward to your favorite parts. But if you want to have fun, start from the beginning. Yeah, have listen, fun, huh? Listen to the whole thing. Don't take the bun off. Eat the whole burger. It's great. Yeah, that's right. So we open up by reading a testimonial from one of our listeners. Their dogs freak out when there's fireworks, and they found that a combination of high-spectrum or full-spectrum hemp oil extract... Um, the brand is Ned that we work with them in combination with brain.fm. This is, these are sounds that actually take your brain and place them in meditative states or focus Takes states on a ride. or creative states. You can pick that combination really calm them down. Now we love Ned's hemp oil extract because not only is it high in CBD, but it has all the other cannabinoids and terpenes and the science is conclusive CBD works best when you combine it with other cannabinoids. So if you want the anti-anxiety effects, the sleep effects, or if you just want to use it on a regular basis for better management of your inflammation, your best bet is to go with a full-spectrum extract like Ned. And because you listen to Mind Pump, you get 15% off. Here's what you do. Go to helloned.com. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com forward slash Mind Pump. And you get 15% off your first uh, purchase. And then we talked about sex scenes in movies, awkward ones. Oh, yeah. Now we got kids, like you got to fast forward and then they ask you questions. Yeah, awkward. Then we talked about uh, our favorite moments in lifting, PRs and achievements that we had when we were younger. So we got to compare those we notes. We used to be cool. Then I talked about watching old home movies with my parents. Um, that was wild. Uh, I talked about how a scientist in England is theorizing that octopus live on your Europa. The uh, the moon of Europa. I think that's Jupiter's moon, if I'm not is mistaken. That what it is? Maybe yeah. I'm crossing uh, my fingers. Then I talk about how I can't wait for the arrival of my baby. We're uh, you know we're we're moving into the end of the third trimester, and I'm really excited to see this baby come out and meet them. Um, uh, little bit Stefano. Then I talk about the sleep routine that I do uh, at night to bank good sleep because I know I'm not going to have good sleep uh, coming up here. So I'm trying to get real good sleep right now. Part of my sleep routine is to drink Organifi's gold juice. It contains compounds that relax the body. It tastes really, really good. And I drink it about an hour before I go to bed. And I have some of the best sleep that I've had uh, anywhere. Um, now, because uh, you listen to Mind Pump, you do get a discount with Organifi. And they have other, by the way, organic plant-based supplements like protein powders and green juices and red juices. The red juice is good pre-workout, by the way. So here's what you do if you want to get the discount. Go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash Mind Pump. Use the code Mind Pump at checkout and get 20% off. Oh, and by the way, I did mention Brain.fm. We have a hookup there too. Just go to Brain.fm forward slash Mind Pump and you'll get 20% off signing up uh, for those sounds that can put you in different mental states. Uh, then we got into the fitness questions. The first one, this person is very picky with the way that they eat uh, meat um, and eggs and whey protein, and they can't get enough protein, but they're picky. So what can mm, they do? Grow up. So we, <laughs> we recommend they eat uh, corn dogs and chicken nuggets. Yeah. Uh, the next question, this person says, why has the dumbbell pullover fallen out of favor? It's one of our favorite exercises. You actually find it in a lot of the MAPS programs. So we talk about the real value of the dumbbell pullover. It's an exercise a lot of you should be doing. So listen to that part of the episode. The next question, this person wants to know what are good priming and warming up movements for golfers. We have a free guide on that, by the way, if you're a golfer and you want to set yourself up before you golf to hit farther and with more accuracy, go to mindpumpfree.com. And then the last question, this person is doing three full body weekly workout routines. So they're working out probably every other day, hitting their full body. By the way, that's one of the best ways to work out. But they want to know what they can do on the off days, and they want to hear all about trigger sessions. Now, trigger sessions is a concept that we've brought up many times on the podcast. It's a great way to turbocharge 
your current workout. It's currently found in our MAPS anabolic program. In fact, if you're looking for expert workout programming, okay, if you want to follow a routine that was written by trainers with lots of experience, okay, we've got combined experience of 60 years, probably combined, uh, you know, worked with over a thousand clients, trained lots of trainers, coached lots of trainers. We know what we're doing. Our workouts are effective. If you want that all planned out for you, one of the best things you could do is enroll in the MAPS RGB bundle. Okay. This combines MAPS anabolic, MAPS performance, and MAPS aesthetic. You follow them in that order. It gives you a full nine months of exercise programming all written out for you. So in nine months, you could do incredible things with your body mm. with the right workout and, of course, with a good diet. Got to have the right plan, Sal. The right plan. You, you, you enroll. You get lifetime access. But if you follow the programs as they're laid out, that's about nine months of workouts. If you want to check out the RGB bundle or other MAPS programs, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. And it's t-shirt time. Oh, shit, Doug. You know it's my favorite time of the week. Oh, yes, it is. It's a great time. We have two winners the for Apple time. Podcasts and two winners for Facebook. The Apple Podcast winners are ZTR32 and Point Blank 62. For Facebook, we have Mason Burnt and Hannah Hoey. All of you are winners. Send the name I just read to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Include your shirt size and your shipping address, and we'll get that shirt right out to you. Hey, Adam. Yep. I want to read off this little testimonial you got from uh, Josiah W. Okay. Uh, it says, not sure if you will read this, Adam, but I wanted to thank you for sharing how calm your dogs, how to calm your dogs down during the fireworks. My dog has been having a hard time with thunderstorms. She freaks out and wants to hide in the bathtub and she cries until I join her. I've been using Ned, which helped a lot, but I added Brain FM, and the combination does miracles. Thanks again so much. I'm telling you. Wait, dude. so you give the dog the, the hemp oil extract? Yes. Put on the Brain FM. So, it w and what I do is like, so for us, like it, it was fireworks, right? So I, we don't deal with thunderstorms so much here, but when the fireworks are going, and this was like a re like a recent hack. I've been doing the Ned for a while, and he's right. Like the Brain FM with the Ned, like takes it to a whole nother level yeah so the ned like calmed him down already which was nice but still if it was like a crazy fart went loud they'd still bark and kind of they just wouldn't go nuts they would bark a little bit well then i figured this hack out where if i put like if i corner my dogs in a part of the house right because i have like those section off gates keep them on one side and then all i do is make sure brain fm is going between the window and where they're at and it it completely you know can cancels the noise that's happening out there, and it gets it gets drowned out in the brain FM, and they don't even realize they're fucking sleep like. And babies. you give them the Ned. Yeah, yeah, it's been a game changer. Is it all like the the nature noises like on the uh, meditation side of we the run, brain FM? We, we run the beach like that's like yeah, yeah, yeah. that's like the that's all my favorite. What happens like to your dogs if you play focus? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't I haven't yeah. tried that yet. I haven't done anything like that. They're we, just chewing just on like their hypnotized, just like yeah, yeah. chewing on their toy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling that shit that work that shit works hella good, dude. It I, does, yeah, man. It's it, it, people uh, ask how often we use it. I use it every night. Max, we we put Max to sleep every single night uh, with brain effect. Do you really every single night? Oh, it's just wow. it's a not it's just like it's part of the routine. What part if of, you're conditioning yeah. him? He'll never be able to fall asleep. Anyway. I don't, maybe no. I don't know. I, I I'm in that a little bit of that conundrum because we do. Uh, Brain of him, we do like white noise uh, with, with the kids, and and you know they've had to now start to wean themselves off it. So they go to a friend's house and stay the night, and it's like they don't have access to that and all that. And so it's like you know to be able to sleep, they got to get used to you know just having nothing, and also like giving to away from any kind of lights in the room and like getting away from like the nightlight stuff. And so yeah, we're kind of going through that. It's a little bit of a struggle. You but could you could try my grandmother's uh, remedy. Oh, for sleep, that? babies that can't sleep, yeah, mm. little uh, grappa on the fingertip. <laughs> is that rum? Is that a little, <laughs> no, a little, dude. Little whiskey. Grappa's <laughs> liquid fire. It's Would like it? it's just pure. I don't know how what the moonshine the alcohol percentages yeah. of it. But it's it'll melt your face. Okay, yeah. and they'll you know especially when they're teething, they put, they put a little bit of finger, <laughs> rub it on the baby's gums. Yeah. Look, it works. I did. I have to do it ten times. I, like I did water. that. Like everyone kept telling me that when he was so he, of of everything that we've dealt with, right? As far as having a, as so far, right? Knock on wood. Uh, a year in, like 
he's been such an amazing baby. Like Max has been really uh, relatively easy, right? Uh, as easy as having a child can be. Um, teething is his only thing. If there's anything that that you can tell, like that bothers him or he cries, like that's when you know, I know it's not feeling. And you could just tell by the way he's gnawing on things and he's always trying to put stuff in his mouth and chew on plastic Drooling. and stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah, so he's like always trying to get a hold of anything that's rough. In fact, he's uh, we we have like gnaw marks on his bed. So like, when he's really bad, he'll get on the top of his bed and he'll like, Argh. yeah, he'll bite down yeah. on the wood and shit. So uh, teething yeah. has been the thing. And everyone's like, oh, you got to put the, you know, the the rum or Jack Daniels or whatever on his fucking gums. And like, really? I don't know. So yeah. I tried it. Uh, it numbs, I guess it numbs your gums. Yeah, that's the idea. I don't know. I didn't feel like it did Put much. a little coca? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. yeah. He doesn't feel his teeth, but he won't yeah. sleep now. I told. Uh, I was. He, I he was, came up with a business plan last yeah. night. I was the most resistant. He's doing burpees. Resistant of it because like uh, <laughs> alcohol runs in Katrina's family, so I'm like, oh, you I, didn't want to touch his yeah, face. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I'm like, I ain't trying to fucking introduce that to him already. Just what <laughs> we need. You know, so he's already got half of your genes in him. So you start seeing like Jack Daniels bottles. Oh, I know. <laughs> that's what I'm worried about. So. They start, you know, the cartoons, old cartoons when they're like trapped on an island and they're hungry yeah. and they look at each other and all of a sudden the guy looks like a hamburger or something. Uh, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He starts looking at Jack Daniels looks like boobs to him. Yeah. <laughs> whiskey tits. Oh. We get some of the whiskey yeah. tits. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's awesome, dude. I, it's a, When they have trouble sleeping, that's a that's a that's a mother man. Yeah. That is tough. He's dude. been bro. He's so good, dude. I, they I, go through phases. Yeah. Well, at least my kids did where they would sleep real good and then out of nowhere, shitty sleep for two weeks. You're just like, okay. I yeah, guess we're gonna deal with this again. Yeah, he's so he's done that, right? Like, but even like, sh well, well, okay. What I call shitty sleep for us is he wakes up twice in the night, right? So that's that's like shitty sleep. Like if he does not go down and stay down all the way at like, this point, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it, at, at all, even the the worst it would. I mean, obviously when they're first born, I mean they're feeding every two hours. Yeah. so I don't count that, right? I mean that's like part of the, that's the part of the process. I think for every. Uh, mom, right? That she, you're breastfeeding every two hours or whatever. So once once we are beyond that, uh, the, then the like a bad night is if he wakes up twice in the night. Mm -hmm. And Katrina, had, she she would just literally put him on her boob and then he'd pass right out. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like, like that, huh? Yeah, it didn't really dis hey. yeah didn't really disrupt me much. Um, and now like he sleep. I mean, we put him down. So the the, the newest challenge is this: is that so. We got conditioned to, so he goes, his routine is he's down by 7.30. And so from 7.30 to midnight is mom and dad time, right? So that's our time to watch movies, hang out, have sex, all the good stuff, right? So that's what we do from like 7.30 to midnight. And he would normally get up like maybe one time through the night and Katrina would give him a bottle and he'd go back down. And that's been our routine for a Well, now that he's like sleeping through the whole night, he when he wakes up, he is awake, Mm. And now he wakes up at like six in the morning, or sometimes five thirty. Ready to go. Ready to go. Like and before, because he'd wake up once or twice in the middle of the night, we could give him a bottle and he could kind of like lay in bed with us and he'd kind of like nod off mm. and like relax and fall maybe sometimes fall asleep with us until we fully wake up around seven. Mm -hmm. But not anymore. Now it's like, okay, I'm sleeping from seven thirty all the way till six. Let's six, rock and roll. Let's rock and roll. It's, now it, does he cause some kids do this and I find this uh, absolutely hilarious. The, you, when they wake up from a nap, does he ever wake up kind of, you know, some kids wake up from a nap and you got to give them like 20 minutes to not be assholes. You know what yeah. I mean? They're kind of oh, in a bad yeah. mood. Yeah. Does he do that where he wakes up and you got to be kind of, oh, okay, don't be a little careful. He's a little fussy right now. Yeah, I wouldn't say he's not fussy, but he is like me in that I need my, like, because he sleeps in a, even in the daytime, so we have the blackout curtains, everything. So if he takes a nap in the daytime, it is pitch black in there. And then you open the door and it's like bright sunny. So you see him like with his eyes like, oh, yeah. shit, dad. You know, like that's need a, to adjust here. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot of light right there. So that yeah. bothers oh, him. Oh, I, I used to have fun with my kids because they'd wake up from a nap and they're, they're kind of in a bad mood. And they'd look at me like, hmm. <laughs> you know, and I'd be like, hey, you know, yeah. I'd try to kiss him. <laughs> I was just had we just had dinner with uh, some friends and they're they have a, a, a little one, a one and a half year old. And uh, we get there and they're like, he just woke up from a nap. So I'm like, oh, this is hilarious. So I kept making eye contact with him and he'd, he'd look at me like, all angry. Wait, don't ask me anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not ready. He needs yeah. coffee. Oh, that was me. Like, even as a kid, that was the same thing. Like, don't <laughs> mess with me until I'm ready. Yeah, you know? I, take, like, I take a while to get up to Oh, dude, yeah, yeah, it's funny. What I'm dealing with now, which is kind of a hilarious uh, 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 problem, I guess I would say, uh, right now is like, so we'll start watching these old movies, uh, you know, Indiana Jones. Like, I'm trying to introduce them to all these the old classics and whatnot. And so I start watching these movies with the kids. I don't 
know, Sal, I'm sure you went through this whole thing where now you start introducing them more. These sex scenes start showing up on movies and TV oh, shows and whatnot. And I'm sitting there watching it with them. And then now they're starting to like ask questions, you know, and it's like puts me and Courtney why on you, the spot. Why, yeah, why'd you pause yeah. and fast forward? <laughs> what happened? Yeah, dude. So they're like, so the awkward one was in, you know, in Indiana Jones and Last Crusade, like there's this moment where, uh, you know, th- this really attractive girl, right, is uh, th- this German girl is like, you know, she's she's basically coming on to uh, Indiana Jones and, and they're kind of interacting and whatnot, but then finds out that his dad already, you know, like had sex with her before that. Right. And so it's like this whole interaction is like, wait a minute, did his dad, you know, like, was, was he with her before that? Like, like, you know, it's like, like they're putting it together and I'm like, I don't know how to answer this. Like, <laughs> this is too much. This is way like, this is a lot of information. What's yeah, funny is you don't think about that. Right. Cause you haven't thought of it like that and yeah. so long and then you probably are going through like oh shit like I didn't even oh, think you, like, that is weird watching like, a I don't movie, have to explain this yeah watching a movie with your kids you have a completely different awareness of the movie like oh shit they just said that okay let's see if the kids noticed you know and yeah I'll make noise sometimes when I know a scene is coming <laughs> up you're that oh, dead yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah I know it's like I know what's about to happen because it's in a movie I've seen a million yeah, times yeah. and the scene's about to come up and let's I'll go get like, some popcorn yeah. well, hey you guys want some yeah. popcorn oh my god that's a hold on a second let me mute this what'd you say you know my kids are like turn it back up yeah it's funny because you know my oldest he's like he's the one like like putting his hand over his eyes and he's like uh oh, you know when they start making out and like you know getting physical and whatnot and then my youngest is just like looking at it like real intensely like hmm like what's happening here <laughs> dude just so, remember it's more awkward for them than it is for you oh yeah i remember as a kid well it's awkward, awkward when, the, well, when yeah once a, you don't understand what's going yes, on yes that's yeah. when it's awkward i remember as a kid i, I probably don't know how old was i 12 maybe so back when, obviously, when we were kids, it was VHS. Mm-hmm. And what my what my dad used to do, and I know other parents did this too, is back then, if you're watching a VHS movie and a scene comes on, you have to stop the movie, fast forward, yes. try to predict when you fast forward. And it now, makes noise. like yeah, <laughs> Now, sometimes the parents, they don't want to do that because then you fast forward too much and you got to rewind and figure it out. So instead, what they do is they just hit fast forward while it's playing mm-hmm. so you can see what's happening. <laughs> But it's all, blah, 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 blah. And yeah, and there's lines. So this is sometimes what they would do if it wasn't too bad. My dad would just hit fast forward, you know, not stop it, but hit fast. So you can kind of see. Yeah. Mm. And we were watching this this Italian movie and with subtitles, and I was like 12, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, okay, whatever, I'm not really into it. And there was a, a like a boob scene, mm-hmm. and so he hits fast forward, but I saw boobs. You still saw the boobs. And it's the most, you know, this is what happens to young men when you're 12, 13. Yeah. You could be, I could be at a funeral. Yeah. I could be underwater. I could be half dead. Something gets triggered. Yeah. You're going to get a rager. Doesn't yeah. matter. Oh, so yeah. you're, I'm sitting with my parents and I got a pillow over my lap and I'm just like, <laughs> 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 just from a flash of boobs. Just like, a, that's all it took, it, uh, you know, as a kid. It was the first time ever yeah. in front of my parents. And then, oh, of course, you're just like, oh, dude, man. I had an awkward thing. I was trying to think of when that happened with my parents, but it was when uh, in Ghostbusters, when, uh, w- you know, when the, when the, ghost, the ghost starts going yes, down dude. on. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Aykroyd and starts, you know, he's like, oh, yeah, oh. And yeah. I'm like, what's happening? Yeah. <laughs> they, they wouldn't answer me. <laughs> how, how, bad did you want, how bad did you want your house to be haunted after that? Oh, I was like, <laughs> ghost do that? I was like, oh, I was wow. like wow, dude, that's <laughs> I want, interesting. I want a ghost BJ. Oh, yeah. God. You know what I'm saying? No, yeah. it's, uh, and this is before, of course, easy access to porn. You, you, you watch movies, these scenes would come up and you would just take mental note and be like, okay. Yeah. When mom and dad aren't home, you know, at... <laughs> 32 minutes and 45 seconds she gets out of the pool and the bikini comes down a little bit. Oh, That's yeah. what I'm going to fast forward to. <laughs> yeah, you know fast times at Richmond High. Oh, uh, uh, you know exactly the movie I'm talking about. Of course I yeah. do. No, yeah. dude, you know what my challenge is right now with uh, with my kids? Um, is that they're because we're a mixed family and they're both half with me and half with their mom, the difference in the households, that is a mm. big, such a big challenge. It's like yeah. in one house, unlimited access to tech. In the other house... It's much more controlled. The nutrition's a little different. And so it's like, what do I do? I'm afraid of being the, you know, am I going to be the too strict house or am yeah. I going to be the- Are going to be the tyrant or do they appreciate that, you know, later on because it's like, the, it's something that they know they can count on is consistent. Well, know? it sucks too is if she's 
overcompensating for you not to, which makes it even more worse. It's one it's one thing if they get to get away with a little bit more at another house, but if it's like she's found like, oh, dad's really strict there, I can be the one who gives them all this and then overcompensates on that. So you're like totally, you're countering well, everything I'm working one on. One of the insecurities is, is a, as a, a parent with dual custody, mixed family, is that you want, you want you don't want your kids to not like being at your house. This is, this is subconscious. You might even be aware of it. But I identified this years uh, later. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm trying to make it the best fun place of all time because I'm a little insecure about, you know, uh, oh, they're not going to want to be here because they're only here, you know, every other week or whatever. Yeah. That sucks. That's, a, that's a, a, a crappy one. Then recently we got in this kind of argument over paying for college. We have totally different ideas about how, you know, what kind of lessons that the, how the kids are going to learn certain lessons. And college comes up, and it's like you, you, we're going to pay for all college. I'm like, no, he, the kids will be an adult at that point. What a great time for them to learn responsibility, how to handle debt, the value of money. It doesn't make any sense to pay for everything, and then it's like they're they're little kids all the way up until they graduate college, and then they got to figure out yeah everything that's going on. It makes yeah. it makes this always huge back and forth about that shit. Oh wow, yeah, oh, man. It's stupid. Lots yeah. of challenges. Yeah, it's so dumb. Anyway, dude, uh, worked out this morning. So you guys know I'm on. Uh, it's 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 time now, right? You guys know that, right? Well, it's time. <laughs> it's time to get hardcore again. Oh yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Good luck with that. Considering you're gonna be another. I was gonna again, say you got a real brief window, bro. <laughs> that's good yeah, to say. Yeah, it runs fast. I remember as you can. that. I was like hardcore for the lead, exactly lead, what's going yeah, on. leading into it, and then <laughs> yeah. I was even rocking and rolling pretty well for like the first month, I'd say. I think because I think I was riding the momentum that I had going into it, which I think this is good that you're doing that right now. Yeah, and then life hits completely. And yeah, yeah. Hit, and then I'm like, okay, I'm just happy if I can get my two or three workouts in a week. Yeah, I'm <laughs> trying to do that right now and get back, you know, get into a really crazy, you know, five six day a week type rhythm. And this morning, as I was working out, you know, it's funny when you're consistent, you start to remember some of these old techniques that you would use every once in a while. And one technique that I love that I haven't really employed uh, a lot uh, recently is to make, to pick a rep count and then make the rep count work. Mm. So what I mean by that is I say, uh, and I, it's with a lightweight, not with a heavyweight. So I don't mean like I make myself do the reps at all costs, but I'll do, I'll pick a weight that is easy to do 20 and I'll say, I'm going to make this a 10 rep set. And then as I'm getting through the set and kind of self adjusting the reps, uh Oh, I'm getting only five left. I feel like I got 10 more in me. I'm going to make these last five, my last five, slowing my reps down, focusing more on the squeeze, focusing more on the stretch. Great workout. I have something for you along mm -hmm. those lines, as far as not that you need this tip, but this is for others that are listening. Um, you know, I was thinking about like, you know, when you get to a place where you've you've been training for a long time and, and understand diet, nutrition, programming, all that stuff. And like, how do you stay motivated and how do you, you know, weather the storm of like something like this, like having a child or business being really busy. And, you know, I was thinking of some of the things that I've done that have, have kept me going that, uh, you know, I stop worrying about a lot of the things that maybe I worried about, like in my early twenties, like, Oh, exactly what I looked like or weighing and measuring food when I was competing, shit like that. That's a, what I focus on is like like accomplishing something that I know I can do and saying like, okay, I want to be able to maintain this. For example, like uh, during first, when I first was having Max, um, I was just coming off with all the mobility thing and I was getting stronger and the ability for me to, uh, and I did, I did a video on Instagram, like back then where I, you know, jumped from my knees, stabilized barefoot and then picked up, I think like 90 pound dumbbells and a deadlift. Mm -hmm. And so- that in itself, what it, the the mobility and the strength and stability it takes to accomplish that for me, it took a while to get to that point. So like when I'm in it, like where I'm at right now, where I'm kind of like in a rut, like that's something that I'll make as a goal. Like and that's the whole focus is I want to get back to where I can do exactly that. Some kind of a physical, yeah, just a, a, that I know the 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 side effect of working towards that. It'll be in, incredible mobility. I'll have great strength. Totally right, and and then it takes this whole pressure off of oh I've got to follow this exact routine or I need to do X, Y, and Z. It's just like, that's the goal. That's the focus. I find it easier to be motivated and to stay focused on like single goals like that, that are related to strength or mobility. And because I've been there before, I know it's something that I could work towards and working towards that. I know that I'll get all these other benefits along the way. And you know what I like about that? Cause people do that, but mm -hmm. they always only do that with a PR. 
I'm going to uh, work towards a max bench or a max. Nothing wrong with that, but if that's all you ever do, right? Um, you're going to hit a wall or hurt yourself. Oh, yeah. So I like that. I like that where rather than it being a, a weight PR, it's like a, a you know it's a different type of physical performance, you know, um, goal. Which right, in yeah. your case was knees to one legged squat or whatever. I yeah. like yeah, I like kettlebells for that too. Like just there's so many complex moves that um, you really have to practice continuously to be able to get uh, proficient in it and also to be able to make it more smooth every time. And so really it's like the goal is completely different. It's really like how pretty can I make this movement? And as a byproduct, you know, you're, you feel like you're getting stronger. Everything's working a lot better. And it's just like, again, it's mentally uh, easier in a sense than, than always trying to like grind your way through and, and get to those like mm. PRs and heavier weight uh, challenges. Do you guys remember some of your, I mean, I know you guys started when you were a little older than I was, but do you guys remember some of your biggest like landmark, you know, achievements when you were working out where, you know, like, for me, like the first time I could do a standing overhead press with the big wheels. That was such a big deal for me. It was mm-hmm. like huge. Uh, yeah. I, I remember I was, I don't know, I was probably 18 or mm. maybe 18 or 19. And I remember when I did that. And, and of course, my dad crushed me because I waited for him to come home and I showed him, expecting him to be like, wow. Yeah. And he cleaned it with one arm. And I was like, well, okay. <laughs> Back to the drawing board. <laughs> it just deflates <laughs> you immediately. Yeah. Wonder why I was insecure. Uh, yeah. Dad. Right? Weird. <laughs> you know? Yeah. For me, well, I think it was when I got three plates on a, um, on a power clean because uh, I had been working, like I'd never done them before. And then uh, going through like a couple different seasons of training and, and still trying to figure it out, like how to best, uh, you know, use energy and get that cut type of snap I needed to be able to get uh, the weight where it needs to be and then drop at the perfect timing and catch it and then drive up and have that strength and everything had to work perfectly. And, uh, you know, so I got like 225, you know, I was around there already because I was just, you know, that was about my strength level. And to, to get one more plate on there was like everything. And then after that, you know, I, I got some more, but it was like that, that, that was a definitive lift for me. Yeah. yeah. I think it depends on what part of my life, like, I, like you, Sal, I mean, I remember that for bench. It was such a big deal. It was a major insecurity as a as a young yeah, boy. Yeah, nobody want no guy wants to bench and not have the big wheel. At yeah. least when we were lifting. Oh it was yeah, such no, a big I had, it was a, I had to start. I had to put twenty fives on, mm-hmm. and then, like for the longest time. I mean, I was training for at least a year, two years before I got to where I could put a forty five on each side. So that was a huge accomplishment. The first time I ever put two plates on a squat was like a huge accomplishment. Now the, the goals are more like mobility focused. It was a big deal not that long Can ago. Can I get out of bed without hurting? Yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, being able to sit down in the, the the whole squat and scroll thing, like that was a big deal for me because I, I worked really hard to, to, to undo so much uh, shit that I think I had put my body in over the, the previous 10 years of mm. lifting. So yeah, I think I still have those today. I mean, even when I was just referring to the, you know, jumping from my knee and being able to stabilize and pick up that much weight uh, and that deep was like a big deal. So there's there's definitely little feats like that that have happened in different p- times in my life. Different things are, are, are a higher priority and a big I deal. I used to love doing that with clients, like a pull-up. That was always a big one, especially for my female clients. Like the oh, yeah. first time they did an actual pull-up. That's it a was, big deal. Oh, it was like high fives in the gym. You know what I mean? Everybody's just super excited, and it's like one of those moments that you'll always remember. Mm-hmm. Speaking of moments, uh, my parents have old uh, home videos. Some of them were recorded. Um, I don't know what it was before VHS, but it was the old camcorder or whatever. There's no sound. The Super 8? Maybe. maybe. Yeah. yeah, so they converted those to VHS, and then they have some old VHS videos. So we were over there the other night, and um, we were talking about, you know, when, how, when my parents got married and how young they were. And my mom's like, let's let's see if we can find the, those old videos. We have them in storage. Let's see if we can put some on. And I'm watching these old videos of my parents, and it was the most eerie. I hadn't seen these things in so long. So now I'm, you know, I'm a 40-year-old man. My parents are in their early 60s, and they put these videos on, and I'm looking at my parents, and they look like little kids to me. Because my parents got married when they were 19. Wow. wow. So I see my mom with two or three kids, and she's not even 30 yet. So she's like in the video, three kids, 10 years younger than me, and I'm looking at her face, and she just looks like a bit. And then my dad looks like some kid. He has no idea what's about to hit him. You know, he's having now, doesn't, all doesn't that, so crazy. Doesn't that give you so much respect, though, for them? Because yeah. you know like your maturity level at that age and that the fact that they raised you pretty damn good. 
You know, I think I think looking at you know parents that actually did raise kids when they were teenagers into early twenties. It's a different. You- it's a different time, and it was a different culture. My my parents were obviously it was that generation, right? So they got married in the in the late late seventies, but they also were raised in a different kind of culture, right? Sicilian culture, and they, my dad especially, and my mom, they lived. Uh, they lived. They grew up fast because they had to. So when my dad was 18, he was a 30-year-old man, essentially. He'd already been working for 10 years. Mm-hmm. He'd already been you know, making money and helping his mom. And he lived, you know, in, in a, he, he shared it up until the day he got married. My dad slept in a double bed with, two other, with his two brothers. And they slept head foot, head foot. So imagine you're, you're, yeah, you sleep next to his brother's crazy. feet. <laughs> yeah, like sardines. Yeah, yeah. And, and so he just... They're just different. So when I see a video of my dad when he's, you know, 19, it's not like you're – he looks like a 19-year-old, yeah. but he's not a – they have all this adversity. And so it's interesting because uh, I know how kids are raised now and how I was raised. So much easier. So it's like if when we encounter hardship, I think we perceive it totally different. Yeah. Like my parents – my mom says that when, when they first got married, she used to buy – they would buy napkins – and she cut them into fours mm-hmm. just to save money. And she said they would ha- they had a special fund that they would have set aside so they could go out once a week. My mom and dad would go out once a week to dinner to guess where? Right. McDonald's. I was going to say fast food. Somewhere McDonald's. Right. They would, that would be like a big deal that they'd go to McDonald's once a week if they did good and they saved money. And it was like this big thing. And, you know, you now, imagine now you take your wife to McDonald's. She's like, are you divorcing me? Yeah. <laughs> Why are we going to McDonald's? What's oh, going man. on? Dude, really did, crazy. Do you ever go back uh, to some of those old pictures, movies, whatnot, and find out something you never knew about, like, either your grandma or, you know, like like an uncle you, you didn't know about? Like, I was going through doing the same kind of a thing with uh, my parents looking at some old pictures and whatnot. And uh, my dad's father, so my grandpa, uh, was he was he was an interesting guy. He was a really funny guy, uh, but uh, he was like an interior designer, real like. Kind of like a like he was short and kind of a, a, a quiet guy, uh, and so I didn't really think much about like him uh, it, when he was a kid and what he was like and all that. And so I found this picture of him on top of this like Indian um, uh, motorcycle, and he had a gun holster and he had a gun on it, Whoa. and like and his hair was all slicked back, and he used to be in a biker gang. <laughs> I was like, what? Grandpa's in a biker gang, dude? Nobody <laughs> told me that. That's badass, you know. Like I. Had no idea like he was like first of all that was back when you know like being an interior designer had a different uh yeah. you know demographic yeah, uh that's you know, being funny. drawn to it oh but. no and in the in the old video that one of the old videos that we saw we were at my grandma's house and so it's all me and my cousins and we're little kids you know so we're like i don't know 10 9 8 or whatever and i don't know what happened in the background so the, the, the camera's being focused on my uncle but you can see in the background and I don't know what one of the kids did, but my grandma takes her shoe off and she starts swinging. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember those days. <laughs> <laughs> so, Go, watch out for grandma's shoe. And then my great-grandfather is in the back, and he's in this video. He's got to be 90. He has to be. And he's sitting down. He's got this scowl on his face, and he's just chain-smoking in the corner. <laughs> I mean, that guy smoked cigarettes since he was 13. Wow. Yeah, chain-smoked all the way through. I don't know how he made it till 90. Probably would have made it to 200 if he didn't yeah. smoke so much. I don't know. Wow, that's, that's crazy. Good Dude, I was reading an article on... Uh, it's this actual science article. This uh, British uh, scientist, I forgot her name, very quite well-respected, came up with a theory that she thinks is uh, you know, pretty legit, that she thinks that there's, gonna, that there's life on... Europa, the 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 planet. Dude, I Earth. saw you putting notes up there and like something about like an octopus. Like, please tell me. So that's, that's- so Europa is covered in ice, and she says that underneath the ice, she says there's very high probability that there's some kind of life, possibly intelligent, like octopus intelligent life, and she thinks that <laughs> would be under. Yeah, Dude. and then and then they were also speculating that Mars, because it has these deep caves and stuff like that they said we're, we're pretty sure we'll find life retreated uh, underground yeah like bacterial life and stuff underground you yeah. know i know that's the kind of stuff that trips me out and like keeps me up at night sometimes yeah it's like, oh dude like because 
a lot of people have speculated that uh, cephalopods and uh, you know uh, octopus, squids, and all that like ha are like aliens in a sense because they, especially octopus because they're really intelligent. Like we really underestimated. Them. You ever seen videos of octopus like figuring out how to like Do open they, the door? They and unscrew stuff. You put you put them in a, in a in a can. They can unscrew themselves out. They can escape like anything. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that weird? <laughs> how long do they live? Are they like jellyfish where they live for a long time? Do you know? No, yeah, I, I don't know that. Yeah, I What's, think check that out, Doug. I have to I, find that out. Yeah, octopus live for. A long I know. Time. I, I know sharks are some of the longest living animals. Well, fact, jelly, I, jellyfish are way more. Are they really? Oh my god, jellyfish are way way longer. Oh, you know what? Look this up, Doug. Let's yeah. see yeah. The, the long because. I'm pretty sure the longest living animal ever recorded. Oh, three to five years? That's it? That's nothing. <laughs> wow, you were way off. <laughs> no, no, that's octopus. Oh, okay. Jellyfish sorry. is what I, I was asking yeah. how long an octopus. Look up jellyfish, though. Look how long a, a, a jellyfish live for. They, they, uh, maybe they don't die of old age. Maybe they just they die of uh, getting eaten. Of, well, yeah. I feel like that's the most alien type creature on this planet. It's just so different than everything else with its tentacles. That's not right, and, Doug. What is it? It's not right. One year? No. <laughs> no. Look, look up oldest, old, oldest living jellyfish. Okay, the immortal jelly, uh, jellyfish, ter, teropit, teropsis? Yeah, dorney. There you go. Teropsis dorney. It's biologically immortal. These small transparent animals hang out in the oceans around the world and can turn back time by reverting to an earlier stage of life, their life cycle. Oh, that's crazy. What? Yeah. That's weird. Biologically immortal. Wow. Uh, wow, wow, wow. So so the, the the longest- That's what all these biohackers are trying to get. The longest recorded, or the oldest recorded animal ever was a Greenland shark, and they did what's called eye lens radiocarbon testing. And they said that they- Sounds accurate. They sent, well, apparently it's, it's accurate. I have no idea. <laughs> But they found one, the maximum reported age. You ready for this? They found a shark that was almost 400 years old. 400 year old shark? So, how weird is that? Okay, you get like Doug how pulls this up it? and it's his lifespan's 20 to 30, and then one guy lives 40 years. Like, how weird is that? 400 years, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, he means he he probably won a lot of fights. He just yeah. chilled. Well, I feel like the big ones, though, like with, with with animals in general, you feel like the bigger ones don't die. last as long. Yeah, yeah, like they die. But but there's whales too that like live a long time. Yeah. Is, now, isn't it true that sharks are one of the animals that don't get cancer? Is that am I am I correct about that? Oh, look, blue whale is almost a hundred years old. Wow, that's a long living. You know, animal. they're intelligent too. Yeah, they're but real intelligent. Aren't sharks though? Aren't sharks the only animals that supposedly don't get cancer? And scientists study why they don't get you know cancer. I don't know. And what the deal is with yeah. that? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So, and there's every other animal or species is supposed to get cancer. I think most animals get something like that, and they they they, they study sharks because. Um, because they they're very resilient to cancer, hmm. and so they're trying to find out why or whatever. I could also be making this up. Yeah, I, I'm, I tend just to reach, go with it, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I tend to reach it. It's cool though when when you start going back to nature and like trying to uh, sort of like deconstruct uh, certain attributes that they have, like and try try to figure out like how we can replicate it and like uh, like if we can regrow limbs and all these types mm -hmm. of things. You know, this is where you, you kind of get into the, the Whole, whole like comic book lore and mm. all that of like uh, you know people trying to like gain those those advantages that mm. certain species have. So so sharks do get cancer. It's rare. Oh, you know what? So it was I on MythBusters. Yeah, you know, I just pulled this up. It said the misconception. No wonder I th I thought this. It's fucking the supplement industry closes me every time. <laughs> that misconception is promoted in part by those who sell shark cartilage, <laughs> who claim that the substance will help cure cancer. Uh, you assholes. Uh, <laughs> you, a, you got trolled, dude. What a bunch of jerks. Yeah. Anyway, dude. You know what I'm really excited about? Mm. Uh, the, the my my baby being born. Oh yeah, the whole process, dude. dude. This is going to be so different for me than than the first two. Oh, like yeah. so different. We did that whole. My first two kids were in the hospital with the whole thing or whatever. It was so much of a blur. I think because I was in my 20s and you're in that space, you know. And Are you doing it at home this time? Yeah, I was going to ask. We're going to have a we're going to have a midwife, everything goes well, it'll be done. I at honestly home. I think that's the way to go, especially right now cuz my sister-in-law is actually going through uh it, you know still going to the hospital and uh she's due actually like pretty close to, oh, to Jessica um but uh I mean the the protocols and everything now cuz of covid it's just it's it's crazy like they're trying to make her wear a mask like going through like uh, you know, labor, and I'm like, dude, that is ridiculous. Yeah, I, I mean, I understand they're, they're yeah, they're, but everybody else has a shield on and a face. Why the hell are you gonna put a, that? That sounds more well, like a 
like a complication that could occur from her not being able to breathe. Yeah, well, the more I read about and learn about the whole process, that those few hours right after the baby's born are extremely important yeah. for bonding. You got to put the baby skin to skin. It helps with them latching when they breastfeed. Um, it produces bonding chemicals and hormones in both the mom and the baby. Mom is less likely to have uh, postpartum depression. When they do that, so uh, I'm just interested. I'm just very excited because I I know I'm going to be so much more present, you know, during this period. Are you and doing like a big uh, getting like a big blow up bathtub, or what are you going to do? Yeah, they do the whole tub thing. And, so, guys, you're getting something. Yeah. Like that. yeah, and they're and they're going to come beforehand and kind of walk us through, you know, the whole process. And I've seen a lot of home births now on YouTube, and we've taken uh, quite a few courses. And, and Jessica's like, she's real deep into well, learning about- some fun videos, huh? Yeah. And actually, <laughs> actually, when you, you know what's crazy? You watch those videos, because here's something that, it just doesn't, you know, just don't process this, right? You, because of the way that our media portrays birth and the whole process, you think to yourself, it can't happen unless there's a doctor there. Oh. Here's the deal. You could know shit about birth. You don't. You could know it's going to happen. Yeah. Baby's gonna I, have, I have a perfect case example. So our neighbors down the street, they just had a kid, and they were. Um, it, she was feeling contractions, but was like, you know, like I, I'm going to take my time, get my stuff, and like they're they're trying to be really chill about it. And um, they were basically like all of a sudden, like oh my god, this is going to come. And so they decided to drive to try and get to the to the hospital and like halfway to the hospital or like it's we're not gonna make it had to pull over and had the baby right there in the parking lot yeah and and her husband delivered it he never he didn't know anything about yeah. like uh the process of that and it just happened well okay so fear and everything was fine fear plays such a big role in the challenge from what i'm reading uh of of childbirth because when you're scared the, the muscles that need to relax to allow the baby to pass through, the, the cervix and how it opens, all those, it makes things much more difficult. Oh, yeah, so I imagine. when I'm watching these home birth videos and what they teach when you when you take these courses with midwives, and, and midwives are, of course, they're the, the, the pinnacle of expertise on natural childbirth. That's just, that's all they do. It's like you, you have to relax and breathe through the process and allow your body to do what it's supposed to do rather than okay, now push as hard as you can. And now, you know, bear down and do this and do that. It's like, you got to work with your body because, and so I'm watching these births at home with these women and you could tell it's uncomfortable for sure, but you could see them oh, breathing and then, oh, the baby's coming out. And then they'll reach down, grab the baby, pull up the baby. And it's like, wow, that's a different, yeah. there's that's like so no different. added pressure from the outside, like barking at them. So yeah. different. And yeah. it's, I find myself getting emotional now. Just, you know, even when I watch those videos, I'm like, oh my God. So yeah. are there other it's things so that you plan to do different? Like at the beginning, are there uh, that, you know, that you did different with the other kids? I'm going into it w completely with a different understanding. I went into it with my other kids. Like, like you do, like you see in the movies. Oh my God, you're giving birth. Got to get to the hospital. Yeah. Oh my God, what's what's going to happen? Okay. Let's make sure everything's okay. Yeah. Now it's like, I forgot the eye hole. Yeah. Much more calm. Um, you know, much more relaxed about it. We know the process and feel much more informed. Um, you know, we've practiced the, these, these, these partner techniques that we are going to do together to where I'm going to help support, you know, Jessica through the process. There's pressures and counter pressures you can put on the body, which for me is amazing because of my understanding of the human body for, through fitness. It's an easy learning uh, curve for me because I can see like, oh, it makes sense if you push here or squeeze here when she's having a, a contraction to help, um, you know, with the process and help yeah. take away some of that pain. So I don't know. It's it's all it's all very, very yeah. fascinating. I'm really looking forward to you know to doing getting this close, thing. man. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. yeah. Hey, I'm 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 back on the the. I'm doing a whole night routine now, just like I'm. I think like with the fitness, I'm trying to bank my sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to like prepare for that. So my, I, I've been doing the sleep routine where, um, you know, turn off the electronics two hours before. I was kind of getting a little lax with that. So two hours before, turn off the electronics, um, and then I'll, I'm doing the uh, the gold juice from Organifi, and I actually brew chamomile tea, and I use the chamomile tea with the gold juice, and I use that uh, in the gold juice to add a little extra sedative power to it. Mm. Sleep like 
like a rock, dude. I, know, yeah. you, I was actually just talking to Organifi, and they were telling us that the, the gold juice and green juice are the top two products that people buy that are listeners of Mind Pump. That's for sure. That's yeah. probably the biggest oh, repeat. Gold juice yeah. uh, uh, with, with hot water. It, like you said, you obviously you make it or as a almond tea. Milk. Or yeah, I just almond. put it in hot water, and it's it's just as amazing. Oh, yeah. I do it yeah. almond milk. Oh, dude, yeah. I, sl- I sleep hard, like just all the way through dreams and the whole deal. And then when I wake up, I don't feel groggy or anything. Now, have you, do you now have you and Jessica discussed at all what nights will look like? You know, if you, are you going to be getting up throughout the night? Or do you have? You, so is this like you're going to figure it out as you go? Or? So so again, totally different. I'm going into this completely different than the first time. So my goal for the, especially for the first six weeks, is to bond with the baby and give uh, Jessica the opportunity to really bond with the baby and for her to move as little as possible. Because what I'm learning is that they, you want to lay supine for definitely the first four, if not next six weeks. It helps the organs get into place. It helps everything heal. It's actually much better than when they go back to working out. Uh, everything works out better, and so I'm. And I want my kids to really be able to bond with their with their sibling. So we're, we're looking into a a postpartum doula. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. Mm, so this is a doula that comes after the baby's born, and their job is to come in and help out. And it can be help out with the baby. It could be help out with cooking nutritious meals, with identifying if there's maybe some postpartum depression, you know, coming up. You know, helping the just just in general, just coming there to be a, a big helper mm-hmm. to a help with that whole process. Because the goal for me is to not worry about anything, but the that first you know six weeks of Jessica healing and everybody really bonding you know with the baby, allow bring the baby into a calm. Uh, loving environment, you know, yeah. so it's totally different than before. I think. Do they also do like the lactation consulting and all that? That's or? already that's yeah. already it's something. Yeah, yeah, that's so. This literally, this is a person that comes and is like help her with everything. And yeah. I, I do forget that Jessica's a first time mom because I've done this before. Yeah, and she's like, yeah, I'm a little anxious when you go back to work. I'm gonna be alone with the baby for the first time. I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that feeling. You know, so this will be. I, so we're looking into it. I think we might end up doing it. Very yeah, cool. that's smart. First question is from Jeremiah Johnson. I am an extremely picky person. It's hard for me to eat meat every day. I don't like whey protein and I can't eat enough eggs a day to hit my protein intake. What options do I have left? God, it's so good to be alive today when we have all these options. Right? <laughs> I know. Right? <laughs> I don't like this. I don't like oh, this. No, I don't like that. I don't like that. I would go. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, well, I I'm gonna throw you in the wilderness, son. <laughs> <laughs> Let's yeah, see what you're uh, gonna yeah, eat there. Yeah. Okay, hey, well, man, Jeremiah, man. your options are other stuff. Yeah. I mean, what are you asking? You know, is yeah. is your question that you want to have more protein in your diet? In which case. You're gonna to have to pick, and you're gonna to have to be able to reframe how you, uh, your perceptions and your ideas and your feelings around some of these foods. Can can you do that? Yes, it's totally possible. I did that. I hated fish for most of my life. Could not stand fish. Mm-hmm. Couldn't stand the smell. Hated it. Didn't like it. And then one year, I became an adult, and I went. We went to Italy. And um, I said to myself, you know, uh, I'm just gonna open. I'm just gonna be open-minded. I'm gonna really try to appreciate the fish. I know it's healthy for me, so I'm gonna appreciate the health uh, aspects of it. And I'm just gonna have some and really try to erase some of my old preconceived notions about mm. fish. And here's what happened: I didn't turn into a fish lover, but now I can eat fish mm-hmm. because I my now because what happened is I developed a different relationship around it because I opened my mind a little bit around a food that I thought I hated or that I had this idea that I hated all the time. So you can try that. Now, if that's too hard for you and you don't want to do that, well, then eat less protein. And there's and the consequence of that, of course, is you're, you're probably why you're asking this question. You'll, maybe you're not going to recover as fast, build as much muscle. So what? If it's too hard for you to eat those foods, then don't eat them. Now, if those foods are foods that cause gastrointestinal issues, and food intolerances, and that's why you can't eat them. Yeah, it's no. a different thing. That's, I don't think that's then it's better to not eat them. But the way you qu- you know qu- asked the question was, I'm picky. No, yeah, yeah, and I again, I think I I would be hard on this guy because that was me, you know, growing up and like having uh, that mentality for a long period of time, and and you know being really. Uh, giving a lot of pushback in terms of like what people would offer. I'm like, oh, I don't really like that. And like, you know, really limiting my options. And I had to work at it. I really had to 
adamantly reframe like, okay, if this is good for me, I got to start uh, finding what I can like about it, you know, and like how I'm feeling afterwards when I just focus on these types of foods and I introduce them into my diet. Uh, and, and, you know, you just got to pick up on different aspects of it to uh, focus on. And, and I think that, um, you know, that takes a lot of work. I had the same issues with fish, like Sal mentioned, uh, that's something that I'm still, even to this day, uh, trying to mentally uh, approach, you know, dishes like that, where I, I'm associating it now, like I used to be really into fishing. And so there was experiences behind it when I catch a oh, fish. That's and, brilliant. That, and that's when I did really enjoy it. And it was a very brief uh, period of my life where I was like, oh, and we, and, you know, and we grilled it and it was a family thing. And, you know, it was like brilliant. a celebration that I, mm -hmm. that I caught the fish. And so I'm trying to like think of these moments where I've, you know, had good, uh, you know, times with, with those types of foods. So I don't know, like, honestly, it's, it's, it's just something that I, I feel this, this just screams to me. It's almost, you got to take it like you're training. You, you got to start training on reframing these types of foods. So that way, if, you know, it's good for you, then uh, it's something that you can start to like and enjoy. I mean, I too, I hated all kinds of shit that I eat now all the time. I hated fish. I hated eggs. Um, vegetables I, probably. I hated Brussels sprouts. I yeah. mean, and these are sta staples in, and a lot of times it's your experience you have with it. The handful of times that you first eat it, you know, uh, I, I still, to this day, I don't like fish that isn't cooked a certain way. And there's certain fishes I like that I don't really care for. And I know like, like salmon, everybody knows like salmon is one of the best. I'm not a big salmon eater. Like I, I like white fish better. So how you prepare it a lot of times can make a difference. Now, this is also highlights why we talk about why getting your protein intake is so hard for vegans because you could still do it. Vegans do it. There's vegans out there that are bodybuilders that get enough protein intake and they're not eating any of these foods. So you can do it. You can eat nuts and seeds and beans and to find your protein. It's just difficult. So if you're going to eliminate, you know, these food groups and say that you don't like them and yet you still care so much about hitting your protein intake, well, you, something's got to give either like Sal said, let go of the fact that you're not going to hit that much protein and you may not build maximal muscle all the time because you're not hitting the most. Doesn't mean you can't build some muscle, you can't be fit, you can't be healthy just because you're not getting, you know, one and a half grams of protein or whatever. That's not a big deal. But if you care that much about getting maximal gains and then you're also being super picky about the food, I mean, I don't know what to tell you in a situation yeah, like that. The part that, that's kind of weird to me is that I don't like whey protein part. Like whey protein, the way that they've, the flavors and stuff that they make, it's almost like a milkshake. Yeah, you don't like with, ice cream? Yeah, I mean, that's... <laughs> you don't I like mean, strawberry cake? I mean, yeah. okay, maybe it's the way... All right, weird guy. Yeah, maybe yeah. it's... <laughs> and I feel like he's... <laughs> this is the guy that gets eats like corn dogs and chicken nuggets, so he gets yeah. his protein. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, look, I mean, you, I mean, maybe try Organifi's protein. There's no way in it. It's all vegan, um, and it's the best tasting vegan protein um, that I've ever had. It's got a great amino acid profile. Maybe try that. But look, here's the deal. Your preferences for food are partially genetic. The studies show that there's some partial genetic uh, preferences, but the bigger part of it, this is proven, is psychological. Yes. The bigger part of, mm. of what foods you prefer and like has to do with what they're associated with, has to do with your past experiences and your current ideas around those foods. Look, you take the average American and you have them walk through an open fish market with the smell of the fish. And and many Americans would be like, oh, yeah. that smells gross. Yeah. You, you take people from Asian countries, people who grow up around these open fish markets, and the smell is alluring to them. There's nothing gross about it. Now, it's all because... Now, I'm, now you could take an American Asian person, someone who grew up here and everything, and they, they, be, they would probably be apprehensive to it as well. And you could take an American that grew up in in China or in Japan, and they would probably like the smell of the open air fish market. So knowing that, you can condition yourself and train yourself by having different ideas around food. I, I When I was a real young kid, I hated meat. My mom will tell the story. Anytime she meets somebody who, you know, and, and they start talking about me like, oh, I know you're, my, my mom loves to tell a story about how mm. I hated to eat meat and how when she would leave, she would leave the room for a second, come back, that the meat wouldn't be on the plate and she'd check the garbage, it'd be in there and then we'd have this big old fight about it or whatever. This is something I did as a kid, I hated meat. Mm. Now, as I got older, I got really into working out yeah. and I learned that meat built muscle. And you found bacon. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I learned that meat built muscle 
And so I developed a completely different association yeah. around meat. And then I started to like the taste of meat. And mm -hmm. so you can do this with yourself. But if you start out by saying, I'm a picky person, you automatically already yeah, right. identify right. as a picky person. This is who I am. You don't have to be. You don't. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, that's you, another thing. I can also not be. Yeah, you right. really don't <laughs> yes. have to be. Be open-minded. Try different foods. Open-minded means don't have expectations. And then learn to value foods for lots of their different values, not just the maybe the hyper palatability of it or the taste of it, but rather how does it make me feel? What is the other values of it? And then if you could get through that and, and start to value foods that way, then what you'll find is that you'll likely start to actually appreciate the food and then you might actually start to crave and enjoy the food. And I've done that to myself and I've trained clients that way many, many times. Next question is from Jamil A144. Why do you think the dumbbell pullover has fallen out of favor in the fitness community when people like Arnold and others of his time used it regularly, especially since it's sometimes referred to as the squat of the upper body. Hasn't but, fallen out of favor for us. Yeah, no. I was going to say, has it really? It's uh, in our routines, and we talk yeah. about it all the time. Maybe yeah. maybe like PRing with it, like you'd mentioned, <laughs> like back in the day, <laughs> like oh, bra bragging rights. Oh, back in the day, before Arnold's time, so you're talking about the 30s and 40s, um, bodybuilders, uh, the pullover was an exercise that they – would often uh, compete with or, or compare notes over who can do the most weight as a for a pullover. The pullover is a phenomenal exercise. It's extremely unique in, in, in its function. It works a lot of the body. It strengthens the muscles of the rib cage. Mm -hmm. It works the pecs. It works the lats. The serratus anterior really has to strengthen and stabilize. Kind of good shoulder mobility to do great, it. Great. Yep. It actually, it's a great exercise to develop yeah, or yeah. keep good shoulder. It's it one, of my, it, yeah. one of my favorite exercises. Here's why I think it fell out of favor because the trend of training body parts became popular. As soon as that happened, oh, where it was point. like- yeah, uh, It's not an isolation exercise at yeah, all. Yeah, like, okay, where do you put it? Chest workout? Back mm. workout? Like, which one do you do? Um, I know Arnold did it in his chest workout. I know other, other bodybuilders do it on the back workout. I prefer to do it uh, on a back workout when I do it. But so it's not, right. a, it's not a, a single body part exercise. It's hard to categorize, and because- Body part split training became popular. That's a good point. That's, that's a pretty good theory. I, w I would guess that. Yeah, that's probably true because it, it's like a, many other move, like a Turkish get up, which was obviously extremely popular back in the days that nobody talks about or uses. It's like one of those things. It's like, where do I put it? Yeah. So then it just fell out of favor because of that. Oh, clean and press. Clean and press was how people did shoulder presses forever. Mm -hmm. But a clean and press is like working so many different muscles that I'll just do a standing overhead press because it's just shoulders. Yeah. Today's shoulder. I know it's day. interesting. They they didn't have racks where they just take it off. You of the racks you'd have to actually pick it up from the ground uh and, and then play you know press it overhead so yeah there was a lot of that and like there's there's a lot of weird categories for a lot of those old type of lifts it's like where do you even put it where do you put a bent press where do you put a windmill you know where do you put all these old you know old school kind of it encompasses way too many muscles uh, yeah to really you, figure you, it out. But we I, talk about this though i mean this is a, i love pullover. yeah no i i definitely maybe we haven't talked about it in a while but we used to talk about pullover all the time as like a favorite exercise oh yeah i mean back in the day the way used to do an incline press you guys know how they used to do it they would have an incline bench there yeah, was they no, had to pick the they had to clean the bar up and then go up. There was no seat. It was yeah. literally like a plank, and yeah. they they clean a weight and then lean back and then do an incline press. Okay, so were they able to use as much weight for their chest? No, but what were the side effects? Like, like built their back, traps, their shoulders, yeah. their traps. Like the the pullover, like a lot of these exercises. Unfortunately, people are missing out on the incredible value that they provide because you know the paradigm became. These you know exercises that work specific body parts. That's really too bad. I you think. know it could almost. It's funny. I've never. I've actually never heard anybody refer to it as a squat of the upper body. But I can get behind it. Hmm. You know, shoulder, even your triceps, uh, your your chest, your back, your abs. Like, yeah. I mean, it does get. It does Especially get full range. Yeah, yeah, you're getting a great stretch. Dude, out of it. When I was in um, judo and when I did uh, grappling, especially if I did no no gi grappling, which is where you just either shirt off or wear a rash guard. Hmm. When I when my pullovers were strong, oh boy, I could do snap downs so hard. I had incredible stability. And if I if I hit you with a hard snap down, you either reacted by standing up, which I'd take you down, or you're hitting the mat. And it was because I was able to develop so much power mm. from a pullover. So it was a lot of function. As far as developing the body, it's one of for me personally, one of my favorite uh back exercises. Um, I love doing pullovers either before I do a pull-up to give me that lat pump. Mm. In fact, I did them this morning 
Um, or I'll do them at the end of the workout to stretch the lats, work the teres major and minor, you know, up at the top. So, and if you follow a MAPS program, you're likely to run into a pullover. I oh, think yeah. it's pro- programmed it a few times. It's got to be in, in definitely in the RGB bundle. It's it's in. I know it's in anabolic, and I know it's in definitely aesthetic. Aesthetic. Yeah. yeah, it's in both those for sure. Um, so if you want to, and here's the thing. The way we wrote our programs is based off of our decades of experience on what really works, not the trends. We don't give a crap about the trends. So if you follow, let's say you did get the RGB bundle and you follow the exercises, what you'll find are exercises that might be popular now. And then you might find exercises that fell out of favor or some that you've never really seen before, Mm -hmm. but they're in there for a reason. It's because they really work. Yeah, they're really good. They show up more than once. Always. Next question is from Mover and Shaker 21. What are good priming movements for golfers? Oh. Uh, Justin, didn't you create a free priming guide for this? I did. That's very specific. And yeah. that was back when we were like, okay, let's do some real specific stuff and see, you know, who's going to respond. So I did put together, it was, it was more of an infographic. So, it, you know, just kind of taking maybe 10 or 12 priming movements that would really help uh, golfers out and, in, and, in, and uh, basically take them through different uh, planes of, of movement. And uh, yeah, so it's all highlighted in something that's actually a free downloadable infographic that you can get on our mindpumpfree.com. I don't yeah. even remember what's in I imagine what, some anti-rotational stuff? Did anti-rotation you stuff. I actually put a little stick mobility in there as okay. well that you can do with or without like your, your golf club even. So if you want to like, if you don't have a stick, you know, you can use your golf club uh, for some of these movements. But uh, yeah, definitely anti-rotation, rotation. rotation. Uh, you, you had like some windmill movements in there. You had some hip hinging movements in there. Um, and uh, really it's about, uh, you know, getting access to those movements and being able to have control. Uh, so that way when, uh, you know, you go to swing and everything, you have control and you have fluidity uh, in your shots. Yeah, the, the the recent study came out on priming and it shows that, first of all, something that I did not realize was that when you prime your body, by the way, for people listening who don't know what that is, think of priming like a very specific and far more effective warm up. So it's like warming up but you're literally uh, getting your body to perform better when you go into your performance, your workout, or whatever. That's what priming is. It's very specific, and it's far more effective than a warm-up, and at the very least, it reduces injury like a warm-up would. Um, so that's what that's you know, all about. But there was that one study, and they showed that priming, the effects of priming lasted like an hour. Mm-hmm. So I, whenever I prime a client, it's always right before they would do their workout. But based according to the study, you could prime your body in an hour. You still have the benefits of it for a whole hour after you've done the priming. Now, what are the benefits? You have more power. You're more explosive, better control, better movement, better stability. So it's literally, if, if you want to add, let's say, I'm going to make up a number, but it's probably around you know, 2 to 5% performance to your whatever you're going to do then you want to do a good 10-minute uh, priming session. Uh, I, I'm, this reminds me of a story. Did you guys ever see those guys at the mall when they would sell those stupid bracelets or necklaces? That, yeah, yeah. Remember they, the, they, the magnet ones, right? Yes, and yeah. baseball players for a second were wearing them. Yeah. You guys remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So this is, I remember, this is right around the time I really started figuring out priming. And so I went to the mall, and I was there with, with a, a friend of mine, and there was a guy you know, talking about these magnets. Put it on, and it increases your performance, and so awesome. And I remember being like, all right, I'm going to go have some fun with this guy. Let's see what happens. And one of the tests that they did was without the bracelet, you stand up on one foot and you put your arm out and then he pushes down on your arm and then he tips you over. Mm -hmm. So he does that first. He goes, try and resist as hard as you can. And then he pushes down and then you kind of tip over. Then right after he puts the bracelet on and then he does it again. And lo and behold, you're way more stable and way more balanced. And so you're like, it's the bracelet. No, no. It's because he primed you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The first set was priming your body. You're going to be better the second time around. And I told him that. I'm like, oh, you know, you just you just set my body up by pushing oh, yeah. down. Yeah. The look on his face, like, huh? <laughs> yeah, like thoracic rotation is something I think a lot of people don't really, uh, you know, get in their everyday lives and everything. So that's definitely one of those, uh, you know, areas that we focused in on in priming for like a golf swing and, and shoulder mobility, obviously hip hinging elements to that. So, you know, doing like a supine scorpion, things like that, where 
but you're you're adding intensity in terms of like intrinsic tension. So mm. this is all part of priming too that I think a lot of people don't really put enough emphasis on is to be able to anchor a certain part of your body for that anti-rotary effect. So if you're rotating and then adding tension, you want to be able to anchor yourself properly and then you're pulling yourself away from that anchor point, creating that tension so your body can respond appropriately. So that's all, all of that is included uh, uh, with that. Yeah, so um, it's mindpumpfree.com com by the way and there's a golfer's guide in there and it's totally free and it literally shows all the movements and stuff justin's talking about next question is from bj ben johnson while doing a three-day full body weekly routine what do you recommend doing on the off days to stimulate stimulate muscle growth i've heard sal promote trigger sessions could you explain what those are and how they help you, you know i just posted in my story i don't know if you guys saw this um where i posted the three most impactful books that i read as an early lifter and so there was arnold schwarzenegger's encyclopedia of bodybuilding that was the first that mm-hmm. showed me all the different exercises then there was mike menser's heavy duty that was really the first book that got me to question common knowledge in muscle building because it was so just opposite of what I had thought was true or whatever. And then the third book was the one that really got me to understand the value of frequency, the power Mm. of sending a frequent muscle building signal. This book was called Dinosaur Training. Mm -hmm. And in the book, he advocates for daily lifting and daily practice of lifting. This was so opposite from what I had read in Flex Magazine and Bodybuilding Magazines where they said, you know, annihilate the muscle or beat up your muscle and then let it rest and recover. And basically what he said in the book was work out every day, just don't work out hard every day. And that frequency signal will get things to move along. And that's when he really started to look at frequency. Now, later on, I observed the effects of frequent, you know, activity on family members and their body parts that were developed. And I've told the story a million times, like my mechanic uncle with the big forearms and all that stuff. And on those off days, do low intensity exercise. Number one, it's going to speed up recovery. It doesn't slow down recovery. It doesn't get in the way. It actually speeds it up. And number two, even though it's low intensity, that doesn't mean it's not sending a small muscle building signal. It's not as loud and as big as the full body workout you might've done the day before, but it does do something. And so what a trigger session essentially is, is a 10 minute light pumping session. You're just doing some exercises to get a little bit of a pump and then you leave it alone. And you could do this a few times a day on the off days and it makes a tremendous difference in how your body develops. Oh yeah, and to kind of back that up, like one of my favorite books I'm always uh, talking about is Super Training uh, by Mel Sif and they, you know they go through all these different studies uh, over from, you know, Russia and one of the things was about the Olympic lifters and how they would lift and uh, really like stay in, in a low to moderate intensity as they would go to do these like really complicated Olympic lifts. And, and they were just, you know, sharpening that that signal of how I lift and go through this movement and trying to, you know, really like master all these little nuances that were involved in, in that process. And so uh, to be able to do that effectively, to, to always do it with intensity, you're going to get in under fatigue and then things are going to get away from you and so it's it's much more effective to just continuously sharpen and work on this like practice and so it's like in terms of trigger sessions it's basically the 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 practiced version of you know doing those exercises before you then get into your workouts well i don't have a good book to reference uh but i do remember reading this study for frequency and when that light bulb first went off for me The problem, though, that I had was I remember realizing like, oh, I need to hit the muscle group more frequently. And the challenge that I had was I still was applying the same mentality that I was before. And so I think that's where I think a lot of people get stuck here. Even our some of our listeners, like they they hear of trigger sessions and then we we talk about frequency. And I got to think that there's a, a large portion of people that probably are applying it the same way that I probably was as a young kid, just thinking more is better. It's, it's a workout. It's right. more workouts. Yeah, exactly. It's more workouts. Of course, if two workouts were good, three would be better, and then four would be better, and five would be better, right? Uh, and the, the thing that took me a while is to really be okay with scaling back uh, the intensity. And it's hard, especially if you've, if you've already been trained to like train hard and you want to sweat and you want to burn. Like I, it's probably the number one thing that I have to address in DMS when people are referring to trigger sessions, they're like, you know, how hard should I go and how heavy should I go and how many should I do? And those are the type of questions when it's like, 
No, don't think of it like that at all. We're literally just trying to pump some blood, practice some movement. You're really trying just to facilitate recovery. I like to talk about it like more like that mm -hmm. than I like to talk about it as increased frequency because increased frequency to so many people just means more workouts. Mm -hmm. And think of it more as like what you're trying to do is send blood to that, that muscle group that, that's sore. I want to send more blood, more oxygen, more nutrients to there. By me doing something really light, it's going to pump fluid into there and speed up the recovery process. So think of it less of like a, a standalone workouts that you're doing throughout the day and think of that, I'm just trying to send send blood, send signals, send fluids, send nutrients to that area, speed up recovery, and that's what's going to help. And then, yes, of course, the increased frequency of touching that muscle is going to do it. But that, to me, is the big hurdle for people that – are learning about trigger sessions is knowing how to separate the difference between a traditional or a foundational workout from what are these things that you guys talk about trigger sessions they really are and that's why we recommend bands like bands are so good for this because they're they're easy they're light you can take them anywhere and you really are just trying to pump some fluid and some blood and oxygen into that muscle totally and here's another way to look at it right so imagine if you're looking at uh, you're looking at a graph or there's a you're, you're standing in front of a clothesline okay you're looking at a clothesline everything below that clothesline means your body is losing muscle everything above that clothesline means your body is building muscle and when you work out, you send a signal that goes above that clothesline. When you're not working out, the signal goes below that clothesline. So now think of the signal as a, as a balloon that's filled with air. So it's not filled with helium, it's filled with air. And so you start out your day and you do a hard, heavy workout. Give that balloon a real hard hit underneath it and it's going to go real high above the clothesline. Now the next day comes around. Well, you, 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 you're not going to be able to recover from another really hard workout, but that's okay because that balloon is still, even though it's floating down slowly, it's still above the clothesline. So now you don't need to hit the hell out of it. You just pop it a little bit. You give it a little pop. Then you wait till the next day, and then it comes down. Uh-oh, it's getting close to the clothesline, but now I'm going to do the hard workout. Pop it real hard again. So essentially what you're doing is you're every single day, either through intense workouts or through light trigger session type workouts, you are maintaining a positive muscle building signal. And the way your body ultimately builds muscle is if the positive signal is outweighs the negative signal because there is no such thing as maintenance in the body. You're always adapting. And when it comes to muscle, it's either building or it's breaking down. Either it doesn't blowing or popping. It doesn't just stay. It doesn't just maintain. So you want to keep that signal popped up uh, you know, above the clothesline and that means some workouts are hard. Oh, but now I'm limited by re my recovery. That's okay. Now I can do a lighter workout and send a, a, a lower level signal. I don't need to send such a loud one. Then the next day, oh, I'm, I'm more recovered. Now I can send a louder signal. If you approach your workout this way, especially if you're looking for maximum gains, like if that's your goal, if you really want to see what your body can do, do two to three trigger sessions on your off days. It will blow your mind. You have to be consistent doing it just once or one day a week not going to do it. Do it every single day on the off day. Try it for a month. Watch what happens. Write me a DM. I promise you it'll blow your mind. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. Come check us out on YouTube if you want to see our faces. Uh, also, you can find us all on Instagram. Doug can be found at Mind Pump Doug, and you can watch his page and look at behind the scenes kind of stuff. Um, Justin can be found at Mind Pump Justin. Adam at Mind Pump Adam. And me, I'm at Mind Pump Sal. So the first trimester, um, this was kind of interesting. Not a lot of physical, like you can't necessarily tell oftentimes, especially with first time moms that they're pregnant, but they feel very different oftentimes. Um, fatigue can be pretty bad in the first trimester and nausea can be pretty bad in yeah. the first trimester.